Now, you were for Fox at one point. I did. I did. You did. Uh, now, you actually were on Bill O'Reilly's show, and you know Bill O'Reilly personally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you've said that Bill O'Reilly is not as bad as people make him out to be. Bill was, was my biggest advocate, man. Um, he was the reason I got a job at Fox News. He, he protected me at Fox News in many ways, and I learned how to do TV from him. I learned how to host TV from Bill O'Reilly. I mean, uh, my biggest influences as hosts were Star Jones, Bill O'Reilly, um, in terms of up close watching it, you know, and, and, and Larry King. Okay. And all very different people. Mm -hmm. Now, did you hear the comments that Bill O'Reilly made about the, the White House being built by slaves and how they were well fed and yeah. nicely housed? Yeah, did man. You, did you cringe? I, I cringed. I, did you I, cringe? I, I cringed. I threw my laptop. You know, sometimes <laughs> he just says, like, he, yeah, I mean, shit's ridiculous. Okay. It's absolutely. Now, but, but this is your man right here saying that. I mean, like I said, I, I've been professionally sort of mentored and trained through observation and, and through conversation with Bill O'Reilly. Doesn't mean we had the same worldview. Mm. I, I can still say, yo, that shit was racist. Like, it, it, it's, not, it's not either or, it's both and. Sometimes racists teach you how to do stuff. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't think you could really sit there and say, they were slaves, but they had it pretty good. Like, like you can't really put those two together. Well, so, I mean, I, I think it's a fairly con common white person position to take, though. He didn't say they had it pretty good. What he said, though, is that they were well-fed and well-housed. Um, but there were, st there were still slaves. Right. No, you, you, you get no <laughs> argument from me. I, I agree with you. I mean, it's an absurd comment. It's insensitive. It's ahistoric. And it, 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 it rests on a set of assumptions that we can't hold on to, like that slave masters were telling the truth or that, you know, or that somehow being, I mean, what does it mean to be well-housed if you're being raped at night? Like, right. I got a queen size bed, I got 600 thread count sheets, but I'm getting raped. Like, I mean, that, that maybe that, that, I would argue that's not even being well housed. So there are all kinds of, of, of ways to think about this in a, differently. Um, but I think we often look at things through the lens of white people and through the lens of white experience. And I think Bill O'Reilly is often victim of that. Do I think Bill O'Reilly inherently believes that white people are better than black people? No, I actually don't. I don't think that he inherently has those kinds of hostile attitudes toward black people. But I think his worldview like many white people, is informed by white supremacy, by racism. And I think that that's just a function of being white in America. I don't think Bill, it's just Bill O'Reilly. I think it's most, most white people. I mean, do you think that there'll ever be reparations for black people in no. America in the same way that there was reparations for Jews no. uh, after Germany? I don't believe that there will be. Um, America doesn't have an appetite for that. Um, America doesn't have a desire for it. You know, to repair the damage done would be to acknowledge our ugly history of slavery and white supremacy. Um, I'd love to see a day where we repair the damage done, whatever that looks like, but I don't believe that repair is gonna come in the form of traditional reparations models in the United States. I think we should advocate for it and fight for it. Um, and we should think very carefully about what that would look like, um, but I'm not optimistic. I mean, if you know, I've been through Israel before and you actually saw buildings and so forth that were paid by reparations, German reparations. Yeah. Like you saw like Mercedes everywhere and so forth. And I, I actually looked into this and studied it and there actually were reparations and it, it didn't make what happened okay, but there was a certain level of healing when there was an admit and, you know, when someone admitted that they fucked up. Right. You now, know, and the fact that America is not admitting that they fucked up. I mean, because I actually, you know, researched some of this stuff. Like they were actually breeding black people like animals back in the day. Oh, you, I you mean, know what I'm saying? Like, like they were actually trying to create the biggest, strongest slaves they could by, by basically forcing the women and finding the biggest men, men and biggest women. Like it's really hor horrific stuff. Oh, it's, 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 actually, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. But that's what I mean. It's, and just as an aside, because we, I, I the, the, those monuments in Israel were built on Palestinian land and stolen Palestinian land in the occupi occupation of Palestine. So this would be very clear that even the healing came at the same time that a new trauma was being initiated in, in 1948 and really even prior to 1948 uh, with the establishment of the state. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. Repair needs to be done. And, and the recognition is as important as anything else. When we had the, that conference on race in Durban back in 2001, the United States walked out. They wouldn't even engage in a conversation about reparations. The United States won't even issue an apology for slavery. Hmm. I mean, this is the country we're talking about here. We have to come to terms with this ugly past before we can do anything about it. I agree. Now, you've explained uh, in the past that black people can't be racist because they lack the institutional power necessary to, 
to deploy racism. Yeah. Explain that. Um, I mean, you just did. I mean, I, I think if we're, it depends on how, I mean, if the problem with that argument, with the problem with the conversation or the debates that circle around my, my point is that we're often defining terms differently. If I said to you, Vlad, how do you define racism? What would you say? Uh, to judge someone by their appearance as opposed to the person that they are. Okay. Now, I would say that's prejudice, right? Not racism. But if I... Well, I mean, I guess it's racist to judge someone by their race as opposed to the actual person. That'd be racist. So if I say all Asians are smart, that's racist? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I would argue that's stereotyping. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a question of definitions, right? So if... Um, I, mean, I mean, usually racism implies a negative connotation as opposed to a positive. You know, by me saying all black people are smart. Am I being racist? Like, you know, I don't think, I don't think, you know, someone would accuse me of racism by saying that. Right. But maybe we should, right? Because I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, all right, that's another piece of it. We can talk about that in a second. But my point okay. is, if you're defining racism as judging somebody based on their skin, then yeah, black people can be racist. If you're, if you're defining racism by uh, denying people access to something based on their race, which, which I think is more along the way, sure. Right. If you say, uh, having beliefs about a person of all people of a certain sort just because they are, they are of that sort. Uh, all black people can dance. All black people can jump. If you're defining that as racism, then sure, black people can be racist. My People take my definition of racism, delete it, insert theirs, and then get mad that I don't, that about what I'm saying, and I'm not saying what they're saying. In other words, my definition of racism, and it's not my personal definition, if you read... Beverly uh, Tatum, if you read any sort of academic scholarship on racism, racism isn't, desi- isn't defined as individual prejudice. It's defined as uh, the kind of, um, the ability, like one person, Nobles defi- defines it as the ability to create reality for other people, essentially, and to have them believe in it as if it is their own. It's a, it's an, mm-hmm. it's a structural investment. Um, if you define racism as the ability to wield power, institutional power, structurally over another race, then yeah, black people can't be racist. We don't have, we're not institutionally empowered in the same way as white people. And I'm not talking about individual black, I'm not talking about Obama or Eric Holder or Loretta Lynch, I'm talking about institutionally, the ability, white people's, white norms define our reality. When we talk about, when you go into the store and buy a flesh colored Band-Aid and it's peach, that's reflective of the fact that white norms govern what we say the normal body looks like. That's why dolls and toys and models and TV hosts tend to look a certain way because they reflect the norm the normative ideals of society. And so I'm saying that in that capacity, black people don't have the power to be racism. Can black people discriminate? Yes. Can black people stereotype? Yes. Can black people be prejudiced? Absolutely. I'm not denying any of that. But racism is a different conversation. Well, I did an interview with with Eddie Griffin uh, at the end of last year. And this interview ended up going everywhere, from Fox to MSNBC to, to, to everywhere. And one of the things that he said that really got a lot of people riled up was there is a systematic effort to destroy every black male entertainment's entertainer's image. They want us all to have an actress by a name. Do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree. I think that um, I think that there's a heightened scrutiny for black people in public. There just is. Um, but I'm always reluctant to ignore human agency as well, right? Like, Bill Cosby's legacy would not be tainted if he hadn't allegedly assaulted so many women. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't want to leave that part out. Now, as far as people holding on to their legacy, Prince held on to his. Muhammad Ali. Well- well, I mean, not exactly. I mean, because he died of a drug overdose. Right, but I mean, that's not the media. I mean, that's how he died. I mean, should we should we just pretend he didn't? Should we pretend he died of old age? I mean, like, he died of an OD, but but we're not we're not tainting his legacy. People love Prince. I love Prince. We all love Prince, and no one is holding that against him. Muhammad Ali passed away. He didn't leave with his legacy intact. Muhammad Ali left with his legacy intact. That's yeah. true. I mean, so I'm 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 not willing to say that people can't leave with their legacy intact. I I agree with Eddie that we tend to demonize black celebrities more, that we tend to attack them more. But Bill Russell's leaving with his legacy intact. 
Harry Belafonte is leaving with his legacy intact. Sidney Poitier is leaving with his legacy intact. He was in the same movies as Bill. He just didn't rape nobody. <laughs> so I'm willing, to, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say that we do have some agency here. At the same time, that we have to be hyper aware of how Hollywood absolutely comes for us all the time. Well, you know, one of the, the regular guests on, on Vlad TV is Laura Jamar. And mm. one of the things that we initially discussed, that we kind of kept discussing over the years, was he felt that America is inherently scared of black men. So when, when you see sort of a, a feminization of the black male, you know, you see like the Kanye with the skirts, or you see certain male actors wearing drag, you know, and, and so forth, that this is white society trying to feel more comfortable with, with their fear of black men. I mean, do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree. I, th I think that, um, I do, th so there's two pieces to that, right? The first piece is the idea that America is fundamentally or inherently scared of black male bodies. I would say yes, mm -hmm. right? Since slavery, right? The idea of black male is dangerous. Black male is a sexual predator. Yeah. Black male is... Right, right. Like, like, for example, like I interviewed Lil Boosie recently, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, he's from Baton Rouge, and we just talked about a lot of the stuff that was happening over there. And he said, look... Arrests with black people and white people are different. I don't care what people say. You know, it's different, you know? The way they, the way they approach the car is different. You know, you, a, a, a white person is going to approach the car for teenage white girls differently than approaching the call for teenage, four teenage black boys with dreads in their head. True. There's an inherent fear of black bodies. It's not just male bodies, also female bodies. Black women are also criminalized and stigmatized in public. So we don't ever want to make this just about black men. Black women are also mistreated by law enforcement. They're viewed as dangerous by the state. They're viewed as criminal. They're viewed as hypersexual, they're viewed as diseased. They're viewed, I mean, all the same things that happen with black men happen with black women, just sometimes by different means. I agree with that. But the idea of saying that men are being emasculated or effeminized, I think, plays into some very dangerous patriarchal and homophobic narratives um, about man masculinity. Like Kanye in a kilt, I believe it was, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's dope. I think um, Young Thug is dope. Um, so so you, you think Young Thug wearing a dress is dope? Yeah. Yeah? Why? Because that's who he wants to be. Okay. That's his gender performance. It's not my gender performance. It's his. Well, but, but, but he says he's not gay. And he might not be. If he says, uh, it, it's not up for me to decide his sexual practice, his sexual desire, his sexual ethic. I don't, I'm not interested, right? But I think there are different ways to perform masculinity. And you can perform masculine. I mean, Prince bent gender in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. Right? From his hair to his boots to the color purple. Well, I mean, to wearing pants with his ass hanging out. Right. I mean, if, you really, if you really want to go there. Right. But that's what I'm saying. And I'm like, right. okay, that's, that's his gender performance. But Prince still identified as heterosexual. But if somebody wanted to come on the scene tomorrow who had a, a, a gender performance that was complicated and also was same gender loving, that's cool too. I don't care. It's, and it's interesting that the stakes are so high for men like that, but when female MCs come out dressed like dudes, what, there's no moral panic. There's no outrage when, when hard body female MCs come out spitting with flannel shirts on back in the 90s or, or the hair and, 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 and cornrows. We just say, oh, that's so-and-so. They rap like that. And we accept them how they are, how they want to perform gender, well, how they but, want to But there's a desire. certain level of acceptance of female sexu uh, homosexuality as opposed to male homosexuality on both sides of the coin. Right, and, that, and that, that's all about male patriarchal fantasy, right? Men, want, men, men will allow for certain types of, of female, female, woman, woman, sexual desire because in, in our minds it still plays into our own erotic fantasy. Like maybe I could jump in, right? right. So, so if they're femme, we're cool. If they're butch, we start getting, we start getting anxious because it's like, oh, wait a minute. That ain't, that, that, that's too much like dudes, right? It's our own masculine anxiety. It's our own homophobia that we have to police. I don't care if a dude wears a dress. I don't care if a dude wants to bend his gender. I don't care if a dude wants to perform masculinity or manhood in ways that we don't normally uh, accept or are used to. I think it's all good. Be who you want to be, love who you want to love, perform the way you want to perform. And I don't see it as a crisis at all. Okay, you have kids? Yes. Okay, uh, boys, girls? One girl. One girl, that's it? Mm hmm Okay, now if you had a boy, you know, would you care if the boy ended up being gay or straight? With that, no. At all, not even a little bit. 
Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. Very progressive. I, I mean, maybe, you know, people have desire. And if his desire is same gender, then what am I going to do? Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think to me, right now, society is a little bit hypocritical. Because you have people like Caitlyn Jenner, which have their own TV show, like, you know, she got Woman of the Year, you know, by, uh, was it the, the ESPYs, I think? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so forth. And everyone is so, oh, it's great, and so forth. But if you ask any parent, I mean, any, any parent that I've talked to, and I've asked, would you prefer for your child to be transgender? Everyone said no. You know, they said they'll still love them if they are, but if you really are into equal rights, then you would prefer someone to be transgender or gay as much as they are to be straight. So I feel it's a little bit hypocritical. Well, I, here's what I think. And, and I, I actually, again, if, if, if I had a child who was trans, I'd be fine with that too. Um, I think... But, but would you prefer it? Like if your daughter became trans, if she said, Dad, I want to be a man, I want to take male hormones, I want to get a, a sex change and so forth, would you promote it? Because if you really are 100% for it, you, you would say, great, let's do it. I would say, great, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Prefer is a different thing. Because prefer means you're putting one over the other. What I'm saying is I have no preference. They can do any, whatever they are, I want them to be. Mm -hmm. I don't prefer them to be boys or girls. I don't prefer them to be gay or straight. I don't prefer them to be trans or cis. I want them to be who they are. I think some parents are worried about the safety of their child, right? We live in a world that's deeply homophobic or transphobic. And so I prefer... Um, my child to be safe, and so some parents think that the way for their child to be safe is to not be those things that render them more unsafe. Um, it's not that they don't like trans folk, they just know the kind of life they're going to have to be born into. That's an argument I hear from many parents. Um, but I, don't, I, I think less about the safety piece at that level, and I think more about wanting my child to be happy. And if my child is, is lesbian, that's fine. If my child is trans, that's fine. I really don't care. I just want to love my child and, and make sure that they're okay. What do you think about the whole situation? Man, my point of view, man, I really feel like they tried to paint a, a bad picture on my brother and tried to make him look like like he was a hater. Uh, it was some envy, jealousy type shit, you know what I'm saying? And actuality, you know what I'm saying? Bro, been having this shit, man. He been in the condo. I got my hat on and I had my Coke bottles up under my hat. And I'm sitting at the dinner table like an asshole with the hat on, knowing she's gonna tell me to take it off. And I'm just sitting there just gawping down, you know, in my zone. She said, take that goddamn hat off at the dinner table. I'm like, come on, mom. Coat everywhere. 